Okay, so we're going to jump straight back into this one where we were previously. We have everything set up at the moment to manage the cameras which are going to be in the world and the player which is going to be possessing them. So we're now going to go into the camera class and we'll be setting up our logic in here to follow the players that we are spawning into the world and also tracking whether the game is in play or not. So first of all, to get our very small function out of the way, which is going to be our game started. Remember, this is the one being called from the game mode when all of the players have been spawned in that will be in the game and the start game button has been pressed. The first thing we want to do is promote the variable being passed in to a variable within the class for us to track. So we'll promote this to variable and call this one active players. It already names that perfectly for us, so we can just leave that as active players. And then I'm going to create a new variable in here as well. This is going to be of type boolean, so the default type is fine. I'm going to call this one B game started, and we'll just drag this one and we'll set this one to be true. If we compile this, just double check and make sure that this starts off by default as false, so we're not tracking anything to begin with. And then that is the game started function complete and ready to go. Now there's a different approach you could take here if you wanted to be slightly more performance focused. Uh, you could start with the class settings, the defaults even, to be uh, set to tick enabled is false to begin with. And then just here, you could set the event tick to be active whenever the game starts. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back into the event tick now and drive all of our follow logic from the event tick. This is the sort of functionality that you do want to be on the event tick though to get that constant smooth updating and movement of the camera. Probably something that in a full game you might want to throw into a C++ class as that's going to be a lot more performance friendly again. And all we're going to do is we're going to use the variable that we've just set. We're going to do a branch check on this. And we're going to make sure that we're only making the camera move if the game has started. The way that I'm going to be doing this is I'm going to make use of the sphere that we've implemented here. If you have a different root component or if you're just using a camera without a root component, then you may want to set the location of the camera or the object that the spring arm is sat on. Before we do this, we're going to get the current world location of the sphere. We want to store this as a variable because we're going to be doing some interpolation in a moment. So we want to make sure we know where the sphere currently is and where it's going to be interpolating to. So we're going to promote this to a variable as well named previous location, because by the time this is used, this will be the previous location of where the camera was. And we can then use that in a calculation to where we're moving. Next, we're going to find all of the actors or the players that we want to track. There's a very handy function that I've just found inside of Unreal to get the average location of these. It's basically an array function called get actor array average location. And the average location of all of the players is exactly where we want our sphere to try and stay. So the next step is to set the actual location of the sphere. So we're going to grab our component again. We'll use the set world location. And you could just drive this immediately to where you want that to be. Like I've said, we're going to interpolate this though just to get a nice smooth Kind of movement going from one location to another so if it has to travel somewhere pretty fast it still has a kind of acceleration and deceleration to that it just looks a little bit better so from the new location we're going to say lip which is our vector function and of course we're going to want to lip from the previous location or where we currently are to the average location of all of the actors and the alpha we can set this to be the speed at which we want to move. So we can set this to something quite low to begin with. Try something like 0.1. You can try different values. You probably won't want to set this above one, but what we can do is to easily test this, we can promote this to a variable and we'll just name this something like move speed. It's not really what it's doing, but that will make a lot more sense when we're looking back over this. So we will also compile this, just double check that that's taken the automatic value. Make sure that we set this to be public so that we can see this in the level. So again, we can do very quick updates using this. And that is pretty much the movement ready to go. So in fact, we can test this kind of one step at a time just to make sure that everything's working as expected. So the camera, first of all, should now have our new value. This isn't obviously going to focus in and out based on the distance between the characters but it should already be moving around to follow where the players are. So I'm just gonna do this with two players for uh, kind of simplicity here. Press start and there you go. You can see that that quickly moved over to the very middle point between our two players and is currently following. If I stop, there's a very small kind of transition from moving to stopping. And again, if we wanted to test that with an even slower movement or faster, 
So to add or remove lag, and we can change our value here. Again, I'll spawn in two different players, press start, and we can see that's a lot slower. There's a much smoother transition before that gets to its location. So I think that's actually quite nice. Uh, we don't need constant tracked movement, so maybe even a really slow value there is going to work quite well for the type of game I've envisioned. Uh, we don't need it to be pinpoint accurate to where the players are, and it means that you're going to be focusing a lot less on the movement of the camera. Okay, so I'm going to leave that as is. I'm actually quite happy with that move speed, and that is the movement done. So that is pretty cool. That's the first step of this done and out of the way. If we wanted, we could even drop this into its own function. So we're going to collapse this into a function, and I'll just call this one calculate camera movement. And again, that's a little bit neater now. We can see exactly what that's going to be responsible for, and that is pretty much all of those values are specific to the camera movement. Next, we're going to want to do something fairly similar. We're going to get the distance between all of the characters and we're going to work out a minimum or maximum spring arm length so that we can zoom in and out to get either closer or further away from all of the players, depending on how far away from each other they are. So we already have most of the components ready for this. We have our active players. For every player in the array that we're tracking, we want to use a for each loop. So we'll just hook all of these up, make this nice and tidy. And when we have this in place, we want to keep track of the current player that we're looking at. So this is going to be one of the important things here. So we'll promote this to a variable just so it's easier to track this rather than putting wires around everywhere. I'm going to call this one the player or current player, doesn't really matter. And then for each of the players in here, we want to find out the character in the next point in the array, how far away they are from the other one. I'm going to do some comparisons against each of the different members of the array to find out which one is furthest away from another player. So to do this, uh, because of, of course, the way that for loops and array indexing works, we're going to say the current array index plus one. So int plus int. And from this, we're going to do a for loop again, but just a standard for loop this time. So for each of these, starting on the first index being one away from the current index, we want to find out the active players. We're going to get the length of this. And this time we're going to minus one from this, as of course we don't want to go out of bounds of the array. And that's going to be the last index that we're going towards. So we're going to calculate up to the last index there. And then what we want to do is again, we're going to get our active players one more time. So I'm just making a copy of active players. We're going to get the current active player that we're looking at. So we're going to get the position in the array from the index that we've just calculated. And we want to find the location in the world. And again, there's a function for this called get distance to. So this is going to get the location of this one and calculate the distance to another actor. So we're going to use the get distance to transformation. We actually want this to be the other actor. This is just going to be a little bit easier to read. And then we want the player that we've promoted just a moment ago, which is currently being set here. So this is the one we want to use. That will be our target. So we're going to get the distance from the current player to the next one in the for loop or in the array position. We're going to add this to an array. Again, if we just search array, we're going to get the array specific functions. We want the add function. And you've seen this process a lot of times. We don't have this array yet. That gives us the correct type. We can promote this to a variable. So just a nice, easy way to get a new array here. I'm going to call this one distance. So we now have a calculated array of distances. We want to find out what the highest distance in our array is. And we're going to do some trickery with our spring arm based on that distance. So quite simple, we're going to get the distance array here. We're going to find the max of float array. So again, another handy built in function. We don't really need to know where it is. All we need to know is what the value is. We're going to clamp this between a certain value. So we're going to clamp the float. And what we want this to be is the minimum and the maximum arm length. So the maximum arm length, the way that we can calculate this, if we go into the world and double check what the current spring arm length is. So around about, we'll call this 2000. I'll just up that to 2000. That's probably the maximum we want to be away. That is everything within view and a little bit more. And then the minimum spring arm length is probably somewhere around here. So maybe let's say five or 600 units may be about right. If everyone's really close, then we can get really kind of close to that action. Uh, so we'll call this one 600. So that's just very simple, the minimum and maximum arm length. And we can set that here. So 600 and 2000. And as always, we want to make this as easy to work with as possible. So we're going to promote both of these to a variable. We'll name the first one min arm length, and then the second one we'll name max arm length. 
This will, of course, pre-populate both of these values with the variable that we've already put in there, so the 600 and 2000. And then I'm going to make both of these public. So again, if we wanted to change this quickly in the world over here, we can have full control over what these values will be, as we can see just here. So we've now clamped this so we can't go past any silly value. We want to move this back a little bit here because the next thing is we're going to get our spring arm. We're going to set the arm length. So I think that set target arm length is what we want to set there as the value. That's simply our access here to the target arm length. We're going to set that to be the return of our clamp. Plug that in here whenever we have completed our for loop. So when we've gone through all of the players and we have our distances, we're going to call this little function down here or calculation down here. And then there's one thing we want to do, of course, at the moment, this array is going to be getting calculated endlessly. We don't want that to happen. So we'll copy this and we'll just call the clear function. So when we've used our value, we want to recalculate everything again and find the new minimum or maximum distance. So this will just stop the array from getting stupidly large and to make sure that we have the current highest distance being tracked. Hey, sorry for the abrupt cut here. I realized whilst I'm editing, I've just missed something, which otherwise I know I'm going to get a lot of questions about below, uh, and that is the sphere still being visible. So in the camera class, what we're going to do is just make sure that you come in. I'm going to get the sphere if you're following the exact same setup, and just make sure that we've been keeping this visible for the game for debugging at the moment. If you're done with debugging, you know that everything's working, and you still want to use this as kind of like the root component, then we can just come in here with the sphere selected and just untick the visible option there. So this means that we're not going to see this at all. It won't be rendered in game. And when we come in and begin spawning all of our players in, we can see, of course, this is the idea that we wanted with no sphere following us around as we move. Some people may not have been aware of that tick option. So I just wanted to make sure that was covered as well. The rest of the video, you will see that still in there because like I said, this was a post recording edit, but just be sure if you're following something, you use a similar kind of process uh, where you want to visualize something without doing a constant debug call on the event tick, then a nice simple way is just to set the collision and the visibility to be off when you're in game. So with that done, we should now have the ability for the spring arm to go in and out. Just do the test again. So I'm going to come in and you can see there is actually, yeah, it jumped in a little bit faster, but as well as moving the, the camera around, we are also keeping the, uh, the spring arm length being updated as well. We can see there's a small issue where the player will eventually be able to get out of camera, but I think that's just because the movement's a little bit too slow. So again, you can work with this. You can very easily change these values here. So maybe something like 0 0.05 would give a nice bit of lag whilst also keeping the two players in screen. Just something to check. And yeah, that feels maybe a little bit better. I think you can probably still just about get out, but these are refinements you can play around with. And then just to be sure, I'm going to set the uh, maybe third and fourth controllers up as well. Okay, so all four players in, we should see how this is going to look. So the camera, like I said, kind of envisioned this to happen where it doesn't look so it changed too much at the beginning there. And that's staying nice and central to all of them, or at the average distance at least. And this is going to be fine, but it just means that at least two of the characters are going to need to be a little bit closer before the spring arm really takes effect. And then again, you can just about get off the camera there. So you may want to change the angle of the spring arm and things like that to really finesse and fix those issues up. But when everyone gets nice and close together, the spring arm comes in nice and close and we can see everything. So I think that's quite a flexible, workable solution there and very dynamic for the way that this will just account for all of the points in the array for all of the players being tracked. And again, to keep things nice and tidy, we'll collapse this to another function. This is just updating the spring arm length. And I realize this is kind of calculating and updating. So I'm going to call this one update camera movement rather than just calculate. And we can then dive into these if we ever needed to update and change these. Now, I've done a similar topic in the past. Something I just wanted to mention here is that in the past when I've done this, I set this on a timer and I realized I was looking at things the wrong way. I actually set the timer to tick more often than the event tick was. And that was the kind of idea of keeping the performance hit down as much as possible. I put in the wrong value without noticing uh, and basically meant that the timer was firing more often than the, the event tick usually would. After playing around and updating a little bit more, even with frame rate independence being accounted for and the lerping, I found that if you put this on a timer, which is maybe half the tick rate or uh, maybe a little bit closer, but not quite as often, you still find it looks a little bit jolty and a little bit laggy, which is why I have ended up opting for the event tick approach just because this feels a lot more 
responsive and smooth as it's following everyone around. The timer just isn't quite as smooth as doing it this way, which is why I mentioned as well. If you were worried about performance, you may want to drop all of this into a C++ class and you'll find that this should work absolutely fine without any frame rate hitches. But even if we're doing this in blueprints, blueprints are normally perfectly fine at calculating this sort of thing anyway. So something to keep in mind is not only am I in the editor at the moment playing this, we can have a number of different controllers involved. If we look at the FPS that we're getting, and the game stats would be better than this, but FPS is a nice simple one to look at. The milliseconds between is handling this pretty well at the moment. Of course, the event tick isn't running at the moment, which is why I'm showing this now. As soon as I start the game, you can see that there's no change in the frame rate here at all. And the other one that we can do is we can set the max FPS kind of unbind that and I'm getting way over 120 FPS with this running on tick and doing this kind of smooth constant update. The calculations we're doing here, although they're fairly frequent, they're not exactly complex. So you obviously here, the general rule of thumb is to avoid event tick at any cost, but there are things you can get away with. There are some things that kind of need to be on the event tick and things like this are fairly standard and you can see you can kind of get away with that anyway. And the other thing to account for as well is that the performance you get in a build is going to be much better than in the editor because you've got so much of the editor stuff being accounted for as well, which really does slow down the performance and the frame rate and the millisecond count there. Just in case some of you were going away from this wondering if this is an okay approach and if this was just kind of bad practice. So generally, Obviously getting lazy and throwing everything on the event tick is bad, but there are things which do benefit from having that smooth constant update like camera movement. So just wanted to cover that. Okay, so that is everything for the local multiplayer setup of the project. We've got the multiple spawns, the drop-in system with a kind of flexible number of players that we can have there and the character select screen as well. And then finally wrapped up with the shared multiplayer camera. So if you've enjoyed going through these videos or found the topics useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That really helps the channel to reach as many people as possible and hopefully help out anyone looking to learn something similar to this. And of course, to be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel, do remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to get updated as soon as a new video is released. Just wanted to say another huge thank you to all of the Patreon supporters of the channel. It's greatly appreciated and your support allows me to keep making and taking time out to do these weekly tutorial topics. As ever though, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.